अगले 30 सेकंड्स में आप बदल सकते हैं अपने लाइफ का ट्रैक एंड नेवर लुक बैक यार छोड़ो ये सारे हैक्स एंड सिंपली लर्न टू गेट अहेड जैसे कि दानिश सिविल इंजीनियर टर्न डेटा साइंटिस्ट हु डिसाइडेड टू सिंपली लर्न और कैसे हुआ ये पॉसिबल विद अ कोर्स फ्रॉम अ प्रीमियर यूनिवर्सिटी मेरे करियर ने लिया एक नया डायरेक्शन ट्रू चैंपियन हु अपस्किल्ड टू विन बिग हाउ बिग a massive hike that transformed my life danish changed gears pretty early in the race but prasen wanted to explore more to get ahead isliye usne kara simply learn from mechanical engineering to a data analyst and a podcaster in his free time aisa career transformation kaise bro simply learn ke industry experts se sikha live aur khud ban gaya data expert itna kuch itni jaldi difficult to raha hoga with a well structured course It felt like a piece of cake. That is simply awesome. What's also awesome is that no sal ke long career ke baad Nitin didn't choose a quick fix. He just added data science into the mix. Nitin, how did you change the game? Worked on real industry problems to become the real deal. A joint family, a regular job, responsibilities to bahut thi, but nothing could stop Nitin from getting ahead. What an all-rounder. Day ho ya night, with flexible learning, you can always make it right. Dashing your situation, चाहे जो भी हो, नितिन, दानिश और प्रसन्न की तरह, you too will find your way to get ahead when you simply learn. क्योंकि आपके लिए shortcuts नहीं, simply learn है सही. Get ahead with simply learn. the city the state and the country you are joining us from the chat is open hi majid india bangalore fort worth texas wasan from bangalore kulabal from canada pakistan canada estonia Great, great, great! We have a wide set of audience today, Brian. It's great, yeah. <clears throat> Now, Akshay, you're going to share where you're from. Ah, uh, so I'm from Simply Learn. I am based in Bangalore, India. Uh, right. what about you, Brian? I'm a uh, Houston, Texas. Now, what's uh, what's the weather like in in Bangalore uh, this evening? Is it? Oh, uh, Bangalore warm? is pretty cool right now. It had a light shower in the evening, and so it's pretty much cool down here. Pleasant. That's great to hear. Nice. I would request all of you to put in your questions in the Q and A box, and we'll be answering them throughout the session today. So let's get started. first let me set up some ground rules for the audience uh, please put your questions in the q and a box please do not put it in the chat box as we might lose track of them uh, the session is being recorded so you will be getting a follow up email with the recording link as well as the webinar certificate and the bonus offer uh, in order to request the proof of attendance you will need to stay till the end of the webinar and fill in the end post webinar survey which will be presented to you after you leave the webinar today first let me introduce uh, myself my name is akshay i am from simply learn bangalore india uh, we are uh, we are the world's number one online boot camp we have been in the industry of digital skills training for over 13 years now and we have uh, trained over 5 million professionals across the globe in over 150 countries so that's what we are here to present today 
And before we begin, I'll have a quick poll question. Uh, we just want to know how many years of experience do our audience have today? Uh, you may be zero to two years, three to five years, five to 10 years, or more than 10 years. I'll quickly launch the poll so you can put punch in your answers. I would request all the participants to punch in their answers. Great, great, great. We have a very engaging audience today. I hope this energy goes on till the end of the webinar. <laughs> I'll keep the poll open for another five seconds and I'll end the poll. Thank you all for your uh, response. Uh, as I can see, Brian, uh, more than 55% of our audience are more than five years of experience. Great. And 16% uh, are still studying and about 30% are between uh, zero to five years of experience. Wonderful. Okay. Moving on. Uh, let's get to the agenda of the webinar today. We'll be talking about you. Uh, then we'll have a short project demo by Brian, where you'll learn lean ops for a superior customer service for a leading entertainment company. Uh, we will have the program, program induction for the postgraduate program in Lean Six Sigma. And we'll also run you through the enrollment steps pretty quickly. And we'll have a Q and A session at the end of the session, where uh, we will be taking your questions. Introducing our mentor for today, we have Mr. Brian Campbell. He has been in the industry of project management and program management for over twenty-five years, and he has been associated with Simply Learn for over ten years, and has been a mentor and trainer at Simply Learn. I would request Brian to introduce himself today. Yeah, thanks so much, Akshay. It's great to be part of the session. So uh, yeah, as you can see, I have a lot of experience background in project program management. Um, and a big part of that actually is leveraging lean practices. So we spend a lot of time in project program management, uh, trying to understand how to increase throughput, remove waste so we can deliver more value. So uh, as a result, I've, I've been spending a lot of time uh, with, with lean and Six Sigma. I also teach courses in that space. And today we're gonna to spend some time looking at a real world example, of how you can apply these techniques to help an organization unlock and deliver more value. Great, great. Thank you, Brian, and welcome to our session today. Uh, before we begin with the live project demo, I would like to run another poll, uh, just to understand why our audience is here today. Uh, you may be looking for a, you may be looking to become a Lean Six Sigma professional, you want to learn a new skill, or you may be here to understand if it's easy to learn Lean Six Sigma, or are you interested in working on new projects which we can add to your portfolio. I'll quickly launch the poll. Uh, please punch in your answers so that we can have an idea of what our audience is looking for today before we begin. I'll keep the poll open for another 10 seconds so you can punch in your answers. I would request all of you to punch in your answers in the poll. Great, great, great. Thank you all for your responses. Uh, as I can see, Brian, uh, most of them are here to learn a new skill. Uh, some of them are looking for working new on projects for their portfolio. Okay. Uh, some are here to understand what how is Lean Six Sigma, is, is it easy to learn? Hmm. And majority are here to become a Lean Six Sigma professional. Okay. Thank you for your responses. Now I would uh, request Brian to take up and take over from our presentation <laughs> and sure. teachers <clears throat> go take us through the live project. I'll just stop yeah, sharing my screen. Okay. Yeah, thanks so much, Akshay, and welcome, everyone. I know you're very interested in kind of seeing a little bit more directly how can you apply some of these ideas and concepts like Lean and Six Sigma to a real-world business environment. So um, just a few things as a, as a kind of, you know, shape what we're going to be spending some time on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually show you uh, an existing case study. And we're going to look at that together, much as you would if you were taking one of the uh, courses and programs offered by Simply Learn at the University of Massachusetts. 
and really use that as a means to kind of identify this is what these techniques look like. Hopefully demystify them a little bit and to give you a sense that hey, these are quite accessible and uh, can be very valuable and useful in the organizations you're working in. Now, this is a, a pretty deep case study, so there's a lot of pieces to it. Uh, we're only going to have about 20 minutes, so we're not going to go uh, maybe as, as far as you would if you were taking this as part of a formal program, but it should give you a pretty good sense of um, of what this this would look like if you were in one of the courses. So uh, let me share our screen and we are going to get started here. Now, another thing I just want to bring to your attention, I'm going to shift gears in a little bit and I'm going to show you a tool called Mural. And that's kind of like a online collaborative whiteboard. Uh, makes it a little easier to kind of track ideas and it's great for having other people kind of participate. So I'm going to show that to you as we we build out and spend a little bit of time uh, on this particular uh, case study. So here's the case study. This is basically a document that uh, you would reference to get a better perspective on a real world uh, organizational situation. So in this particular instance, we were going to be talking about big money casinos. And this is a, a casino that um, is responsible for a large number of casinos around the world. It's a pretty big organization, as one might expect, because if you know much about the casino and the entertainment industry, uh, typically these work seven by 24, seven days a week. So they're always in operation. They usually have not just their casinos, but their entertainment, as well as uh, food services, and of course, a lot of times they're hotels and accommodations. So these are large, very complex uh, environments. And one of the things is we kind of look at uh, the context, you get a sense of how big it is, you get a sense of maybe the net revenue. But more importantly, what we're interested in seeing is what challenge are they facing? Okay, so when we think about introducing lean practices and behaviors, it's usually because there's a problem. Okay, there's something that's happening that we think getting more efficient, more effective at will help us unlock more value. So in this particular instance, <clears throat> we say, uh, see that this is sort of in the past, in 2008, the economic and environment for big money was in serious concern. So they were having some real uh, challenges, mostly because of this large you know, recession, the great recession at that time period. And not surprisingly, it's reducing customer spending on entertainment you're concerned about maybe your job or maybe you've lost your job, probably not going to go out to a casino or some kind of entertainment environment um, and, and spend your money. So they're, they're struggling with that. So they really want to find a way in which they can uh, help minimize the impact of that decline in revenue. And then in addition, we'll see that they really recognize the importance of embracing customer service as a really essential element of their operating strategy. And why is that? Well, if you think about it, if you go to these kind of uh, you know environments, you are you know looking for a positive experience. You want to have fun. You're kind of getting away from from uh, your work and uh, and some of your maybe day to day responsibilities. And you want to you know relax and uh, enjoy some entertainment, some good food, some uh, some some gambling activities. So that's what brings people to these settings. So there's a real interest in ensuring that they have a positive customer experience. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pivot over to this tool uh, called Mural. And we're going to use this to kind of track a few ideas that we want to think about. So the first is we want to make sure we have a clear understanding of the problem. What problem are we trying to solve? So we've got two segments to this. One is we want to be able to respond to that macroeconomic you know, collapse, the Great Recession impact, which is seeing a decline in revenues and competition for market share. And the second part is to increase our customer service. <clears throat> so if we pivot back to our um, case study, and I've taken the time to kind of read a little bit ahead of this and to highlight a few sections that are relevant for our conversation today, we'll kind of skim down a little bit, but we see that there's some challenges. Um, one is, to the casino employees, they're a little concerned about that word lean. They think lean means cutting jobs, which probably isn't surprising considering there's this big you know, recession going on. So they're legitimately concerned that when some part of the organization says, hey, we're gonna get more efficient, their definition of efficient might be reducing jobs. So we know one of the things we need to do is we want to ensure that we 
are make, working with these uh, people in the organization and uh, answering their questions and also helping them understand this is not about reducing the headcount. This is about uh, becoming more efficient with the work that we're doing. <clears throat> so notice up here, one of the first things that they've recommended we do is create a regional lean team. So let's think about that. Uh, and also in the context of this idea that lean is might be associated with cutting jobs. So we're gonna form a lean team. And what would a lean team look like? Well, there's probably a few things we wanna give some thought to. One is wanna make sure that the team has a good representation of different people, right? So we probably want, uh, you know, some, some leaders, some people who can make good decisions, maybe have some authority to, uh, to make, you know, prove uh, improvements or to uh, spend money if necessary. We also want some of the, uh, you know, individual contributors. These are the people actually doing the work. Okay, these are folks who are in a, maybe on the casino floors or working in one of the restaurants. Um, any number of those kind of roles, we want some of the representation because of the ones doing the work. And we probably want some, you know, change champions, some people that are really passionate about these ideas saying, yeah, you know what, uh, I think this is a great direction to take. Uh, what can I do to help promote these ideas, spread the message, uh, really be part of the solution. So when we think of our lean team, we really want to make sure that we've got uh, these types of representatives on it. Now, uh, a good guide when you're creating any kind of team is to kind of consider keeping the team about, you know, anywhere from five to 10 people. We don't want the team to get too large because that's going to bog down its ability to make decisions and to, to kind of operate and function. So once we've got this lean team established, you can see that they're all kind of centered around this theme of lean. They're going to look at these two problem statements and they're going to ask, what can we do to make things better. Well, one of the first things we're probably going to want the team to really give some thought to is let's think about creating a culture, a lean mindset within the organization. Okay, so this is going to be really important. We want them to give some thought to um, the lean mindset and make sure that they're uh, promoting these ideas, explaining to people what that means, maybe reassuring them that to lean doesn't mean we're cutting jobs. It in fact just means we're getting it more efficient and effective than the work that we're gonna do. So we kind of kind of see lean mindset as sort of a broad concept that this team is gonna champion. So what would that look like? Well, they might be developing maybe some newsletters and communications that go out to people. Uh, they could be offering training. Uh, they could just be providing support to groups that want to uh, spend more time leveraging these lean practices. Now, the second part, once we get that lean mindset established, we probably want the lean team to also start thinking about how are we going to actually see some of these improvements emerge? And this part becomes really important because this is where we're actually going to see the real benefits of some of these lean practices. So we've got the lean team looking at situations where they're going to work with groups to identify where is the waste occurring? hey, we're trying to save as much money as we can because we're getting our revenue sort of squeezed right now. So let's find ways we can be more efficient and effective. So let's take a look back at our case study. And you'll see that um, we've got, sorry, uh, switch there, um, a few ideas that have emerged. One is this idea of a five-day Kaizen workshop. Now, just to bring to your attention, but the whole concept of lean really has its roots in the Japanese manufacturing uh, industry. So this came out of the 50s. There were some um, you know, important thought leaders, Peter Drucker and others, and they looked at how Japan was building cars because at the time in the US, the car manufacturing industry was really lagging. They were having a hard time being competitive with the cheaper imports coming from countries like Japan and Europe. And also the quality of American cars was really kind of bad. Uh, if you've got, you know, some, some grandparents uh, or uh, some, some relatives who might remember that time period, uh, there was a time it just, you know, you didn't want to buy an American car because it just was so many issues and defects that they had. And the Japanese cars were seen as being very reliable. So there's a lot of interest in understanding what was the Japanese solution to this. 
And part of the reason I bring that up is we're going to hear a lot of words that are actually Japanese. And Kaizen is an example of one of those words. And Kaizen really is a Japanese term. And I can't say I speak Japanese. Might have some people on the call that, that do. Um, really talks about making improvements. And the way they make these improvements is instead of kind of, you know, retooling everything and, you know, we're going to spend months and change it all at once. It's about making small micro improvements that over time add up to really, really big impacts. So a big part of that in Lean is instilling a culture of continuous improvement. So what does that look like? Well, a couple of things. We want the people doing the work to feel empowered that when they see something that's not efficient or wasteful, that they have you know, confidence that they can go in and make those changes. Uh, the second thing is we want to kind of uh, spend time as an organization focusing on continuous improvement. We want to encourage everyone to make sure that they're spending time thinking about how they can be more efficient, more effective. Where do we see unnecessary waste? So what we're seeing here is that they're proposing a five-day Kaizen workshop. And this workshop is something we can engage with different teams and look at how they are working and understand their processes so we can identify those ways. So let's go back to our, um, our mural board here. Sorry, bear with me. And uh, so we've got these uh, five days. So we know we've got sort of day one, two, three, four, and five. So let me just pop those in here. And then we'll kind of think about what we're going to do in each of those five days. And this is the point where we're really kind of getting close to where the work is occurring, right? We're going to work at the team level and we're going to say, hey, let's look at how you're operating. And we're going to use that to better understand how they can improve. Okay, so I'll call this sort of a team Kaizen review. And we've got our lean team and they're going to say, hey, we're here to help facilitate these sessions. And we're going to use that as a place to identify where these, these wastes might occur. So one of the first things we need to do when we're thinking of a lean uh, Kaizen event is we want to think about what are we going to do the first day? How do we help people get more comfortable with these lean concepts? So um, day one, we're going to focus on education. We're going to make sure people understand the reason we want to spend time on this. We want to help them understand what kind of waste there are and then uh, use that to identify where those wastes are. So a couple of things a little bit interesting about here. So we're going to spend day one on lean concepts. And we're also going to introduce this term called downtime. And downtime is an acronym, which stands for defects, overproduction, waiting, not engaging people, transportation, inventory, motion, and extra processing. So this is day one. Let's spend, uh, kind of pop this into our um, mural so we know what we're dealing with here. Okay, so we'll put that there. Maybe we'll call this day one. Hey, get people introduced to concepts like downtime and uh, what else we're going to do where we're going to educate people on lean concepts. So, so that's the, the starting point for our Kaizen workshop. All right. So once we've got that in place, we've got a good understanding of sort of what the intent of lean is. Uh, this is also going to help broaden that lean mindset awareness across the whole organization. Each time we work with a team, uh, they're going to go through this process. Each team's going to leave with a better understanding of the lean mindset. They're also going to have this set of techniques where they can identify where there are wastes. And what kind of wastes are we thinking about? Well, every organization is going to be a little bit different. This is, of course, dealing with sort of the, um, you know, customer service and uh, sort of entertainment space. So some examples of defects might be um, uh, delivering a drink to a customer with ice when they ask for no ice. Well, that's a defect, right? Because you're going to have to go take that drink back, refill it, bring it back to the guest. You've wasted some time. Or maybe a guest checking into a hotel room that has the wrong bed type. They asked for two queen beds and instead they got a king size bed. 
So now you've got to kind of unbook them from that room, find a room that has a king size bed. Uh, so that adds a lot of time. And it also gives a poor impression of that customer experience. You can see examples through the rest of this. Things like overproduction. What would overproduction look like in this kind of environment? Well, maybe when you're serving water, it comes with uh, a slice, a lemon slice to kind of give some flavor to the water. But we, you know, the servers are providing three lemon slices. And you might think, ah, what's a couple of extra lemon slices? But once you multiply that by possibly tens of thousands of drink orders every single day, that adds up pretty quickly. So we want to find ways in which we can uh, limit the amount of overproduction we do. Another is waiting. Anytime there's waiting, you're waiting for something where employees are idle or a customer is waiting for the service is a form of waste. Who wants to, to wait, right? It's not a fun experience. No one enjoys that. So we really want to be on the lookout for any time we're seeing our valuable people and our customers waiting and find ways in which we can kind of um, provide them the service more e quickly. Uh, not engaging people. So this is a really important in a customer service domain. We want to make sure that we're spending time actually connecting with the people, um, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, when we're trying to uh, move something like a, uh, a food cart and it's going across a deep pile carpeting and corridors, it leads to not just longer time to get that food to where it needs to go to, but it makes the employees pushing that tired. Uh, transportation is another one. We want to make sure that uh, the work that people are doing uh, minimizes the amount of transportation required. So we want to make sure, that, for example, if uh, you're working in, uh, in the restaurant area, you're providing drinks, if every time an order comes in, you have to run away to, all the way to the back of the uh, kitchen to uh, maybe fill up water glasses and bring that back to your tray that you take out, maybe we should move the water uh, station closer to where staff are coming into the kitchen, reduce the amount of transportation. Uh, inventory is another good example. A lot of times organizations have excess inventory and excess inventory in and of itself is, um, is waste. It's not something we can do anything with. It's just sitting there getting obsolete. And a lot of times that inventory just gets thrown out if it, it becomes too old. So they have an example where uh, each team, the team was ordering $10,000 worth of slot paper for their slot machines regardless of what inventory they had, they're just putting in the order consistently. But when demand went down, suddenly they had this increasing amount of slot paper that was available on the floor. And of course that required more storage and the slot paper often would become obsolete if they changed anything on, uh, on what was required to be printed. But we talked a little bit about motion as well. We want to find ways in which we reduce the amount of motion that people are uh, uh, performing like, you know, things like getting water or getting napkins or things like that. And then extra processing, this basically refers to any time uh, we're doing work that is non-value added. In this example, they talk about uh, they had security guards who'd use metal detecting wands to scan bags of trash coming out of the cash counting room uh, to make sure that there are no coins that are being smuggled out. But at some point, the casino eliminated metal coins from operations. They only used plastic coins. So waving the metal wand over the garbage bags doesn't make a lot of sense because you're never going to find any of that. So those are some examples of how we can use that acronym downtime to identify the different types of waste that might occur in an operation like that. So once we've got kind of a good feel of you know, what waste is and why it's important to remove and we can identify the different types of waste, then we wanted to do something called a Gemba walk. And again, this is another Japanese term. Gemba in this case means sort of walking around. So why do we want to do that? Well, we want to get close to the, where the work is being done to really understand what's happening. So this is something where that team with the people they've been training would go out onto the floors, into the work areas where the team operates and give them, give them a little visibility to what's actually going on. And we'd use that to identify some areas where we see some improvement opportunities. So that's day two. We're gonna walk around and uh, get some um, more visibility to the, the type of work that is being performed. Let's see if I can make this at least the same color so we're a little bit consistent. Okay, so we'll, we'll spend time on day two, kind of walking around, checking out what's going on in the environment. Okay, and then in day three, what are we going to do? 
Well, we're going to kind of look at these observations and you can see some examples. You get yellow stickies, you kind of map out the process, who does what, where there might be dependencies. You get the people doing the work to give you this visibility and let them discover where the wastes are, where the inefficiencies are. And once you've got a good sense of you know, how you can improve things, um, you might look at you know, redesigning the location of work items. So it's easy to get to. And this is called a spaghetti diagram here. If you can see my screen, it just shows where people are going from one place to the next. So you say, oh, there's a lot of traffic going way to the back. Now let's move those items a little closer to where they're needed. Um, we might need to prioritize waste. Maybe you're going to see lots and lots of waste. So you're going to ask, well, which things are the most important? What are the things that we think if we remove now will have bigger impact later on? So in day three, we're going to look at the root cause of all the waste. We're going to ask ourselves, what are the things that um, we want to do differently so we can remove that waste? And one of the things you're going to use is some techniques like uh, 5S. And that's a technique that is used quite a bit in these settings, uh, the S is actually in this case Latin. Don't ask me why we've switched from Japanese to Latin, but the uh, the S in this case is really asking um, some some fundamental questions about um, why things are sitting where they are. And in fact, another really powerful technique is the five whys. And what we do with five whys is we just ask the question why five times, and that can be pretty powerful because you know they have an example here. Um, why do attendants <clears throat> spend four hours a day polishing clean silverware? So the silverware has been cleaned, and yet the uh, attendants have to spend four hours of each day, each one of them, polishing it. Why? Well, because it has spots, and that doesn't look acceptable on our dining table. Why does it have spots? Well, because when it comes out of the dishwasher, it has spots on it. But why does the dishwasher leave spots in the silverware? Well, it's because the dishwasher doesn't hold a consistent temperature during one of the phases of this cleaning cycle. Huh. Why? Why does that cleaning cycle not hold a consistent temperature? Well, it's because the preventative maintenance protocol is not being uh, uh, maintained to the manufacturer's recommendations. Okay, so now we know the root cause. So what can we do to fix it? Well, let's bring things back up to the maintenance protocol. And by fixing that, we don't have the spots anymore and it frees up four hours a day for our attendants cleaning that silverware. So that's an example of some root cause analysis we do. Okay, so once we've got some ideas on what the root cause is, now we can come up with solutions on how we can fix those root causes. So that's day four. We're going to dig into um, the uh, potential solutions here. And we'll just add day four here. Now we've got solutions that are going to make it easier for us to uh, uh, fix these problems. And um, once we've you know had some of these brainstormings, and this is where uh, we use that concept of the five S's, which stand for um, Siri, Seitan, Seiso, Sekitsu, and Shusaki. Oh, sorry, they are Japanese. My bad. I thought they were uh, uh, Latin previously. But uh, basically, it means sort, set in order, shine, standardize, and sustain. And what does that mean? Well, um, you're going to sort. First off, let's look at all the things we have. Maybe you've got a big inventory room uh, where you've been accumulating a lot of inventory over many years. Um, if in doubt, throw it out. Take a look at everything, things that are unnecessary. Let's get them out of the way because they make it hard to find the things that are necessary. So we'll get rid of all the out-of-date orders. We'll set in order. We'll make sure everything's got a place for everything and everything in its place. So make sure it's easy to find the things that you need, have clearly marked labels on them all. Shine, let's make sure we clean and inspect the workplace, make sure everything's thoroughly clean, neat, and functioning property. Um, standardize, make sure we create and enforce policies and procedures that make this a daily practice, not a one-time event. Remember, we talked about continuous improvement. And then sustain, how do we make sure we institutionalize this so people do it all the time? That's part of that lean mindset. So we'll uh, kind of add these techniques to what we do on day four when we're kind of brainstorming, or you might have seen the term try storming. Let's just try doing things a little bit different so we can make things better. And once we've kind of gone through this exercise and you can see some pictures from before and after, here's one of the inventory storage rooms, you know, 
Looks like boxes are just stacked a little bit irregularly and they've uh, restructured it. We've got clear labels at the top. We've got things stacked up uh, appropriately. You immediately visually can see where you might be running low on certain items, maybe where you have excess inventory. You don't need to order more of the items that uh, perhaps are stacked up a little higher. Now, finally, once we're, we're finished all this, um, a few things that you, know, you should be aware of. This activity, this Kaizen process is so impactful that it can often eliminate almost 90% of the waste observations that it made. So think about that for a second. You go in and within five days, you can remove 90% of the waste. So this is an incredibly valuable investment. A lot of it's just driven by common sense, right? We're not doing anything you know, really un, out of the ordinary here. We're just kind of looking how we're working and asking some questions and how we can be more efficient. And we're really giving the people doing the work the opportunity to, to identify where those improvements are. And finally, what we want to do on day five, we want to take the findings and we want to present them back to our leadership, our customers, kind of show them, hey, we've spent time on this. This is what we've come up with as some improvements and um, get their support if necessary. Um, and also help them recognize that this has really saved time and improved operations. So a big part of this, as hopefully you're, you're picking out, we've looked at this case study. We've got an organization that was in trouble, right? They're struggling with revenue and they need to get more efficient and effective with their cost management. So this is really the foundation of our lean culture. We really want to ensure that we understand how we're operating, that we introduce some KPI, some key performance indicators, so we get a better understanding of how we're working together and make sure that we are solving problems as we discover them so we can eliminate this waste. So we can probably take this little picture here. Okay, we'll pop it in maybe here. Where it went. Maybe it's uh, a little difficulty uh, pacing this in. So I'm try one more time. Um, <clears throat> we'll cut it and see if that helps. Well, maybe it's not going to work today. Um, but we really, that lean um, view should be our house of lean. We want to create this whole culture that recognizes that lean and, and waste removal is everyone's responsibility. So one of the things that we wanna take away from this is, so what were the results? Well, within a little over a year, um, this organization conducted 60 of these Kaizen events. So they went to 60 different teams with more than 400 employees, 14,000 hours put into this, and they saw some pretty significant results. You might remember the very beginning of this, it talked about the fact that they saved over $3 million in ongoing savings. So that's pretty powerful, right? Because you're getting that $3 million, not just now, but every year that goes forward. So it kind of compounds on itself. So what we can see is um, some of the results that we have here, and I kind of pop them into the test, uh, sort of this area. So these are the, the outcomes that we want to kind of track and measure. And um, let me just put that term there because that's an important thing we want to focus on. We really want to ensure that we're getting outcomes. we getting real value from the work that we're doing. Okay, so these are the outcomes that came from this. And what were some of those outcomes? Well, let's take ourselves back to our um, presentation here. There were five key things that we really walked around away with. First is creating that lean mindset. We created a lean team to help communicate and promote the lean mindset of how to remove waste. We recognize that actions speak louder than words. So we don't just want to tell people to do this. We want to go in and help them do this. How do we do that? Those five-day Kaizen workshops. We made sure senior leaders were aware of what was going on. So they'd be supportive of it and they free up the time necessary for the teams to do these Kaizen workshops. Make sure employees are involved. We really wanna get the people doing the work engaged and part of this uh, activity and then keep it simple. I mean, a lot of this wasn't super complicated, right? It was about things like, hey, let's reduce the amount of time we're polishing a silverware. Let's get better at organizing our inventory. Let's uh, make sure that we're not, you know, you know booking, uh, 
people for the wrong rooms. And if we are, let's ask those five whys on what we can do to kind of identify the root cause of the problems. So all told, this is kind of an example. Now, again, I went through this pretty quickly, uh, but hopefully you can get a little sense of the flow. We had a problem statement. We had, uh, we kind of organized a team. We promoted this mindset. We did these Kaizen reviews, and then we got these outcomes. These are the results that are gonna help the organization uh, continue to succeed, and we can quantify those. There's $3 million put back in your pocket. Uh, that, that's going to help uh, make sure we can get through this typical time to a point where the economy recovers and people continue to come out to these casinos going forward. So actually, I think that's it. Uh, might have been a little over than our original time, but uh, hopefully it's helpful. And if you've got some questions, pop those into the Q&A and we'll get to those um, as soon as we wrap up the session here. That was really insightful, Brian. I, even I learned a thing and I am sure our audience did too. I would request the audience uh, to post your questions in the Q&A box so that we can take it up as we go along. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, I'll quickly share my screen again. So that's what we what we learned from our session today. Uh, moving on. Uh, so this is what, just one of the projects where we will be coming across your course, uh, the postgraduate program in the in Lean Six Sigma. Uh, so one qu quick co poll we have for our audience, uh, what's really stopping you from becoming a Lean Six Sigma expert? I'll quickly launch the poll. Uh, uh, are you unable to find a program which, which has a completely comprehensive curriculum or is it that you don't have enough practical exposure? To become job ready? Uh, are you finding it difficult to learn from pre-recorded videos or your work schedule just doesn't allow you enough time to learn? Uh, I would request all of you to punch in your uh, answers and we'll be answering your queries shortly. I'll keep the poll open for another 10 seconds. Uh, I would request all of you to punch in your answers. Great, 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 great. Thank you all for the responses. I'll end the poll now. So as I can see, uh, Brian, uh, people here, majority, uh, the 50% of our audience says that they don't have enough practical exposure. I'm glad we had this session today where people got a taste of what the program actually entails, uh, a live project demo. And let me remind the audience that this is just one of the projects that you will be going through in your curriculum. There are uh, about 15 more projects which you can go through and uh, three capstone projects as well, which you can uh, work on and add it to your portfolio. And so now that we have your answers, uh, we would like to introduce our program, the postgraduate program in Lean Six Sigma, which has a comprehensive curriculum with an industry aligned learning path. It has case studies, hands-on projects, uh, one of them which you just went across, uh, went through, uh, and we also have simulated tests for practical experience. We also conduct online live virtual classrooms with peer and instructor interaction, uh, and it's really flexible, which will fit into your lifestyle and schedule. So this program, if you invest about five to 10 hours a week, you'll be able to complete in the period of six months. This program is brought to you by UMass, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and it's powered by KPMG. The content provider is obviously Howard Business Publishing Education. Coming to the program benefits, uh, you'll be getting the UMass Amherst Postgraduate Program Certification. Uh, it will have 150 hours of applied learning. Uh, we will, you will be going through three Harvard case studies, 17 hands-on projects, one of which you went through just now, and about 18 simulation exams. We will have three capstone projects, which will help you uh, materialize whatever you learn through during the course and uh, apply them in real world projects. You'll also earn 122 P uh, credits to your continuing certification requirements. We will have master classes from our University of Massachusetts Amherst and even senior consultants from KPMG. You will uh, be given the alumni membership of UMass Amherst and you'll also have access to nine credits, which are transferable 
to the online MBA program provided by UMass Amherst. Coming to the UMass Amherst advantage, we all know that UMass is a 130-year-old institution when it has been consistently ranking the, in one of the top U.S. universities. Because uh, the program will give you the cert UMass Amherst per certificates and along with master classes, and you'll be all be all be uh, you'll be preparing for the Lean Six Sigma Green Belt and Black Belt certification. We got a question on similar lines. How do we get a Lean Six Sigma Green Belt and Black Belt certification? This program will certainly help you prepare for these exams and clear them. And having the UMass uh, or Amherst certification on your CV will be recognized worldwide. Coming to the KPMG advantage, this course is powered by KPMG. KPMG, as we all know, is one of the big four consulting firms with the presence of over 140 countries. You will have senior KPMG consultants who will give you the correct guidance, training, and mentoring throughout the course. I would request Brian to take us through the different steps where in the course, which will help our learners have a comprehensive learning path. Sure, sure. So um, yeah, as you can see, this sort of follows a very uh, structured and uh, well-organized approach. We're gonna start with getting everyone comfortable with these concepts of lean management. We just got a little flavor of them in the uh, demo that we just did. Once you're uh, comfortable with that, we're going to shift you into leveraging some agile practices. Lean and agile fit together very, very well. Um, agile really looks at reducing waste as we're delivering value. So it partners nicely with the whole lean management structure. So we're going to get you some uh, skills in that space, particularly with practices like Scrum and Kanban and extreme programming and test-driven development. All those are really, really powerful techniques and tools that you can apply in your work environment. Then we're gonna give you some exposure to some tooling. This product called Minitab is a statistical tool. And a lot of times we have to look at large sets of data and use that to understand what is sort of the average performance and then understand what we can do to kind of improve that. Then we can um, progress into improving and increasing our Lean Six Sigma skills through practical application. So we've got our Lean Six Sigma Green Belt, Lean Six Sigma Black Belt. Those are just progressions. You start Green Belt, then you move to Black Belt, each one building on the other. And that's going to give you an opportunity to apply these techniques in real world settings using some of the uh, examples that we heard Akshay talk about, all those different you know, real world project program examples. Uh, then we're going to shift into digital transformation. This is a really important concept that is uh, being embraced by organizations and industries across the world. How can they shift to more digital delivery? And the reason that's important because digital delivery allows them to become much, much more efficient. Okay, Instead of having people moving pieces of paper around, typing things in manually many times, we try and shift all that to kind of a digital environment. And then it makes it easier for organizations to kind of pivot and shift and respond to market demand. And finally, we'll wrap things up with that Lean Six Sigma capstone project, an example of which we just spent a little time on. Uh, you're going to go very deep into this. You're going to get a chance to really apply all the skills that you've learned through the program. And then you're going to exit it with this really powerful example of how you apply those tools and techniques that have been mentored by one of the coaches in the program so you can showcase this to your existing employer or future employers. Great, great. Thank you, Brian. Moving on, these are some of the program icons we have already discussed. Uh, you'll be learning the different uh, waste fighting measures of lean practices, uh, eliminate the root causes of defects and waste, understand Lean Sigma's DMAC phases, which is define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. Uh, you can become a key stakeholder in leading, implementing the Lean Six Sigma projects in your organization. And we already discussed the 5S waste reduction process planning. Uh, these are some of the tools that you will be mastering during the course. Uh, the DMAC, Agile, PM, Bob, V6, Lean Six Sigma, and the tools as well, Minitab, Mina, uh, Mina Jira, Office, and Project. These are some of the projects you'll be working on during the course. Uh, these are Harvard case studies and projects. One of them we already discussed. Uh, and there'll be, apart from these four, there'll be many, many more which you can put your uh, uh, implement your skills on as well. As we already discussed, you'll be going through some of the caption projects, which will obviously 
enhance your CVs and uh, which will be you will be able to showcase to your future employers and get that interview you are always looking for. And at the end of your end of all, uh, you'll be having the postgraduate certification. Uh, as I already mentioned, you'll be receiving nine credits transferable to an online MBA as well. Uh, and we'll be having the Amherst Alumni Association membership and we'll also help you prepare for the Lean Six and Lean Green Belt as well as the Black Belt certifications. Uh, we have some of the global leaders as program advisors, uh, including Alan Robinson. He's the operations management professor in uh, University of Massachusetts. Uh, Michelle Burge, she's a senior lecturer in the institution as well. Coming to the eligibility criteria of this program, uh, you may uh, it's not necessary to have a programming background. You can have any background and you will be, uh, you need to have a bachelor's degree in any discipline and you need to have a minimum of five years of experience to enroll in this program. So now that you have understood the various projects and uh, skills that you'll be taking up, we would like to run a quick poll to understand if you will be interested in enrolling for this program. I will quickly launch the poll so that you can punch in your answers. Great, 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 great. I'll keep the poll open for another five seconds. Please punch in your answers. It's a simple yes or no. I'll end the poll now. As I can see, over 60% of our audience is already interested in enrolling for the program. And that's great. Moving on, I'll quickly run you through the enrollment steps. We have three simple steps. The first step involves you need to send an application, uh, which will be uh, you will need to send an email to the you know, email ID mentioned below here, ask us at simplyland.net. Uh, and once you have submitted the application, our team will be reviewing the application uh, regarding your background and your work experience. Once the application is approved, you'll be getting an admission letter from UMass Amherst. Uh, if some, if any of you guys are uh, interested in enrolling right away, our next cohort starts on the October of 28th, and the, for which the induction class will be held on the October 23rd, and the batch will begin on October 28th. The, coming to the pricing, we have priced it at a reasonable 2299 US dollars for US candidates, and uh, about 97,999 plus GST to the candidates in India. If you have any further questions regarding, we also have uh, EMI options for our candidates. So if you have are interested, please send in your requests and emails to ask us at simplyland.net. And let me also inform you that we have limited seats for every cohort. Uh, you'll be able to get more details on our uh, website as well. So now that you know, uh, now that you know the schedule and I would like to uh, run a quick poll again. Uh, how soon do you plan to enroll for this program? It may be immediately, uh, within six months, within six, three months or more than six months from now. So we would like to just punch in your answers. I'll keep the poll open for another five seconds. I would request all of you to punch in your answers. Great, great, great. Thank you all for your responses. Coming to the questions, uh, we have a few questions, Brian. Uh, I would just quickly shoot them to you. Sure. Yeah, I can see. We've already yeah. answered some of the questions. How do I get a green and black belt? Obviously, this program will help you uh, prepare for these exams, and uh, you can. Uh, uh, so we have a question, Brian. Uh, what are the similarities or differences between lean and agile? Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> lean and agile pair together very, very well. So lean is about removing, reducing waste. And that's something Agile emphasizes a lot. If you've used Agile practices before, things like retrospectives that are an opportunity for the team to kind of ask what worked well, 
what can we do better? How can we improve? So a lot of times we consider lean and agile kind of being the same. In fact, a lot of organizations call it lean agile for that very reason. Thank you. So uh, we have another question. Uh, what are the differences between the belts? Like, uh, green uh, the primary belt difference and... is simply that the, the green belt is sort of a starter. You know, you're learning and applying black belt. You're just applying more skills, getting more in depth in the analysis. So it's just a progression. <clears throat> got it, got it, thank you. So uh, we we'll have uh, one last question here, uh, Brian. How difficult is green belt and the other exams? Well, I will say they're uh, they're they're challenging. Uh, you're not going to uh, be able to get through them <clears throat> without uh, preparing. Uh, you'll absolutely need to have some course um, support. So going through courses like this, uh, then you're going to have a um, combination of an online exam. And you'll have to show an example of work that you've completed that supports these lean practices. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty comprehensive, but this is part of the reason organizations really look for people who can prove that they have these skills and they've earned these certifications. So the nice thing about this program is the partnership with Simpler and the University of Massachusetts is they give you the support you need so you can get these certifications and show that you've got these skills. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, there's one question from Ravi. I will just take it up. Does one have to complete black belt also to, in order to get UMass? Uh, Ravi, no. Uh, you'll be, uh, once you enroll for this program, you'll, uh, you'll be able to prepare for the green belt and black belt certifications. Uh, it's not necessary to complete black belt in order to get a UMass certificate if I answer the question correctly. Thank you all. Uh, that's it. Uh, if I apologize if we are not able to answer any of your questions. I would request you to shoot your questions and applications to ask us at simplylearn.net. I've also posted the uh, course page link on, on the chat you can access. I'll post it again. Uh, and you can access our course page for more details of the program and you can always send an inquiry and our team will get back to you. One last poll we have, uh, if you need any assistance to enroll, I will quickly launch the poll. So those who have uh, expressed their interest in enrolling for the program, if you need any kind of assistance to get enrolled for this program, we will be more than happy to help you. Please punch in your answers in the poll. I'll just keep this open for now a few seconds and I'll close the poll. Thank you all for your responses. Uh, those who have answered a yes in this poll, our team will be getting back to you as soon as possible and we'll be helping you with the further process of enrollment. And uh, with that, I would like to thank our mentor for today, Brian. Uh, it was a really insightful session, the project demo, and we really learned something. And if I would request the audience, if you are willing to learn even more such insightful projects we would really love you to see on the learning community uh, i have already posted the link uh, you can always visit our website and enroll for the program i would like to thank brian brian it was a really insight, uh, insightful session yes thanks so much it was great spending some time with everyone and i did pop a few uh responses to a couple your questions in the chat as well. So maybe take a look at that before you sign off. And uh, Akshay, uh, hope you have a wonderful evening. Looking forward to our next session together. And thanks, everyone. Have a great remainder of your day. Thank you all for joining us today. I will end the webinar now. Thank you. Have a nice, great day. Take care.